Hi everyone. Um, good morning to our London friends um, who actually based in Chicago now just back to the UK for holiday. Um, Tim Parson and also Jessica Charles Woods, um, the design studio uh, design researcher. Um, so welcome to our Enable Talks 11, uh, a part of the Jockey Cup Objects Talk and Perfect Ecologies Education Project, which is uh, we're just starting this spring. And this is our second phase, which is we're working with um, university uh, students from design school and um, working in a local area, some Shui Po in Hong Kong. And we've been uh, working with primary and secondary school, looking at non-human objects in the local area. And I think this multi-species human is not the human, non-human centric approach is really new in Asia context, especially in urban city like Hong Kong. So this is why we want to um, give our students or interns some new perspective. And that's why we invite Tim and Jess to sharing the project, which is about they call post-human. So it's even more advanced or something more speculative. Um, so hopefully this will give our intern, our student um, some new thinking um, because they are doing, they have done the immersion last week, which is they all become uh, objects and non-human objects in some shape or And this week they are investigating and analyzing the objects they pick up and also building a ecologist with the other objects. So I think they are in the midway or um, they're actually going to design something next two weeks, which is based on their observation and this new experience. So hopefully um, Tim and Jess will, will give them even more um, interesting inspiration. So I think the stage is for you guys. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah. thanks so much. Thanks for inviting us here. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, share my screen um, so that you can see our presentation and optimize for video clips. <laughs> okay, and press play. And hopefully, can you see the presentation okay? Yeah, great. Um, awesome. I also. Well, I'm just going to try and, all right, I'm just going to get started. So, um, yeah, we're going to speak. And uh, this talk is really uh, about how our studio is exploring various uh, sort of social and ecological um, and technological challenges um, through design. And uh, it really f uses this. Uh, project, as Yankee mentioned, um, this catalogue for the post-human project as a, uh, a, the main case study. And the image that, you, that you're looking at is of the latest version of that project, uh, which was an installation of the Venice Architecture Biennale um, last year called Catalogue for the Post-Human. Um, but um, yeah, before we get into the project, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, so, um, Yes, do you want to, to kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a little snapshot from our studio. And I, so going back into my background, I originally studied three-dimensional design in Manchester in the north of England, at sort of undergraduate level. And then I was lucky to go on and do a master's course in design interactions at the place called Royal College of Arts, where Yankee went to in London. And that was at graduate level. And it was run, the course that I did was run by two professors who really inspired me, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby. Yeah, and I also studied uh, industrial design at undergrad and also went to the RCA uh, to study a program called Design Products. And we had separate careers uh, in teaching and design research before we moved to Chicago uh, in 2010, which is when we set up our studio. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we now collaborate as uh, sort of artists and designers focusing on the objects and habits of, of humankind. And we use a lot of different media, sort of sculpture, objects, narrative writing, photography, um, to comment on these various uh, te social and te technological issues. So we're going to start um, by um, showing you a short one minute kind of commercial or what we call an infomercial 
that we recently made that gives you a bit of a taste of what this catalog for the post-human project is about. So I'm going to play that now. Catalog for the post-human provides human enhancement products for today's contingent worker. We give you the tools to succeed, increasing your autonomy. With the advance of the control society, algorithmic performance metrics, digital behavior monitoring, and worker analytics, success relies upon your mind and body being fully optimized at all times. Adjust your circadian rhythms to your work schedule. Dial up the right cognitive state for your next gig, using smart drugs, safeguard your microbiome with soil-based probiotic lollipops, or absorb vitamins intravenously while you work. Analyze your data and make it work for you. Train your personal AI to improve your joint employability. Whatever your gig economy needs, Catalog for the Post Human is your guide to success. Visit us online at cftph.work or visit our Venice Trade Fair stand at Hall 2, Arsenale Building, Venice Architecture Biennale 2021. Open until November 21st. So, uh, in case it wasn't obvious, then that's obviously this uh, commercial for a, a fictional technology company. And uh, we've created this as a platform for exploring various different issues. So, um, the, um, Jess is going to talk a little bit about the origins of the project. Yeah, the origins of this whole project catalogue for the post-humans, I think, started about eight years ago, maybe seven, eight years ago in 2014. Um, the Open Society Foundations, which is, this is the logo here, it, they are a, a grant-making organization <clears throat> based in the US, and they promote social justice, and they began a huge study about technology and the future of work and, and the impacts that will have. And the idea was to move beyond sort of binaries, like automation will take jobs, and they wanted to understand the landscape in a lot more detail. And the ultimate question, the sort of impetus behind the project was that the new research questions have arisen, such as how has technology shaped not just the number of jobs, but also the nature of work. And in Open Society Foundation's own words, the ultimate question um, is how precisely technology will change life for various kinds of American workers. So we chose to focus on human enhancement technologies. In other words, technologies we use on and in the body to increase our capabilities. So we felt that these human enhancement technologies inhabited a really critical space in this debate about technology displacing work uh, because they kind of problematized this divide between technology and people. So for example, if you're wearing a headset that enables you to concentrate better or an exoskeleton that helps you lift things, your capabilities are obviously being enhanced by these technologies. And with many areas of the workforce becoming increasingly reliant uh, upon technology to gain a uh, competitive advantage, the issues were not just about jobs being replaced by technology, but about people becoming technology in order to remain employable. So part of our research for this project was to understand the extent of the human enhancement technologies that are already out there. And we then extrapolated these to consider what products might appear uh, in the near future. Um, and then we had to decide on the format that we wanted to convey this information. <laughs> so some of you may know about this catalog called SkyMal. Uh, it so was, uh, it, yeah, maybe it's not so common uh, where you are, but this catalog used to be available on commercial flights. And um, uh, the great thing about it was that you get really kind of insane product ideas mixed in with more reasonable ones. So as you flicked through it, <laughs> it made you think, um, are they really serious? You know, is this a real product? 
Um, and we wanted to borrow that format so that viewers were placed in this position of questioning what they were looking at and saying, is this a good idea? Uh, and what are the implications on people using it? So um, our project, so we, we took that format and created a, our own uh, catalogue and had uh, the, the response for Open Society Foundations uh, came in two parts. We, did, we first of all did a, a traditional research document um, that covered all of our <laughs> research in the territory. Yeah. And Is everything all right over there? Uh, yeah. Okay. And I think we, can we ask a small question? Is sure. it a style that on your slide we have like a few um, graphics like squares and oh. something like that? On the, is it on the top? Yeah, the one on the top and the one on the right hand <laughs> side. We were thinking, is it the graphics? Uh, or? What? It's no. the zoom, it's the weird zoom shadow, but I think oh, we can so hide them actually. If we press more at the top there. Oh, that's weird. Okay, hang on a sec. I think it's the zoom graphics sort of overlaying on top of our presentation. Yeah, we've heard about this problem before oh. because I'm using a single screen. Um, once uh, um, zoom actually puts a, a shadow over it. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to try and, and get rid of it, but I can't can't guarantee. Oh, yeah. That we'll if if yeah, if it doesn't block your your graphics, I think. Oh, okay. Hide floating meeting controls. Ah, uh, okay. There you go. That might work better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes. How's yes. That? That works Great. better. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's still something on the top. Um, yeah, I don't. But never mind. Never mind. I think, never mind. I think it's much better already. Yeah. I'm just trying to pretend it's not there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. That's great. Continue. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, they were um, like floating invaders into our presentation. I know, yeah, <laughs> very strange, very strange. So we did this research document and then we created this speculative catalogue of enhancement yeah. products. Um, and um, so the idea was to produce this document that uh, uh, people who are uh, um, working to support uh, the rights of workers uh, would then use to discuss how technology uh, might impact on the future of work. So, um, and it, it had this kind of satirical tone. Uh, in other words, uh, it was, um, you know, a little bit intentionally um, uh, sarcastic, intentionally kind of pushing um, the boundaries a bit of what might actually happen, but in order to create some uh, discussion. So um, it had these various different sections. One was about physical augmentation. So I mentioned exoskeletons, things like that. Um, and uh, mental augmentation. Um, and then there was one uh, about uh, uh, training and monitoring and data. Um, we don't know exactly how the Open Society Foundations use the catalogue, but this process made us realise that this format of uh, a fictional company and a fictional catalogue of products could be really useful to help anyone discuss these issues and become aware of them. And then, so that was something we made in 2014, and that was the first part of Catalogue for the Post Human. And in 2019, we were commissioned to create an actual physical version of the catalog for the Designs for Different Futures exhibition. And this was a collaboration between the Philadelphia Museum of Art in the East Coast of the US and a place called the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis and then the Art Institute of Chicago. And we created a quite an, an, an alternative looking vending machine containing six objects and an interactive touchscreen interface that would allow you to find out more about each one of these products that we took from the catalogue. Rather than just making some of the objects from the catalogue, 
we decided to revisit the whole subject, being that five years have moved on, and conduct more research and create six new products from new research. So I know this is not a readable slide, that's uh, intentional. Uh, like most design research for corporate work, there's a process of mapping and synthesis that happens. And we try to group our findings and identify themes and sub-themes. Um, so what you're seeing is this master mind map uh, of this project. So we, we did this process, we pulled out impactful quotes uh, on the subject and tried to recognize where there was some interesting traction in terms of issues and arguments. And we mapped these findings against the various human enhancement technologies, uh, behavioral changes and, and global societal changes. So uh, most of these finding, findings pointed towards what has been called the rise of the gig economy. Uh, in other words, a de decrease in conventional salary jobs, fewer benefits, uh, more restrictive contracts, older retirement age, and increased workplace surveillance. Um, so um, these were the sorts of trends that we're seeing, and um, people often lump those together by, by calling it the, the gig economy or the rise of the gig economy. Um, and from this big picture um, mind map, um, we then made a more focused map of themes that were more specifically relevant to the project. And um, so these themes included productivity, training, health and medication, AI collaboration, surveillance and monitoring, and uh, profile and reputation. Um, and um, you can see on the right hand side, the, we um, used various uh, different categories in order to, uh, um, to categorize all of those uh, um, results. Uh, so we also then uh, conducted interviews with a series of experts uh, who were working in fields of human enhancement technology and the future of work. And this provided us with some really great insights that we were able to take into the next stage of the project, which was generating personas from which we identified ideas uh, for objects. And um, I don't know if you want to talk a bit what a persona is first. Yeah, it was actually a way to almost create characters um, that you might find in a story. And these people can be an amalgamation of um, different various insights or information that you gather from research and you want to try and um, almost be able to some of these values into um, um, a bit like being, are you actually taking on different types of avatars? Um, hopefully, you can still hear us. <laughs> so, yeah, there were different series of personas, and this is really something we use a lot in our process. We sort of go through that research, reading, primary research, secondary research process, taking in a lot, and then we sort of translate or sort of synthesize that information. Um, and we need to start somewhere and pull out these different insights and different pieces of information. And using personas to develop strands, whether they're sulfur, the biohacker, the extreme empath, and or the microbiome obsessive. And these are not real people that we know, but they are an amalgamation of different habits that we started to create ourselves to help us start the project. Um, for example, the cognitive enhancer on the right here, we were interested in this idea of cognitive states and what kind of states would this enhancer want to what would each job and the sort of pharmaceuticals or drugs that they would need to take to get them into and out of that kind of state. And being that we're all creating physical outcomes and sort of for each persona we made like a board you know a mood board is something that you may all be using or collect you know a collage of written research and notes and sketches and visual material that might be something you found online and we really rely on these to start building a visual sort of set of able to start responding to the question and what that we've created is 
what kind of tools or objects would these personas either choose to use, compel or force to use to stay in their eyes competitive and productive? And we edited these down. As uh, you might kind of criteria we used uh, uh, to choose those objects. So uh, before we showed you the objects, as we'll just explain those. Uh, so this Venn diagram uh, is a way of explaining what the, the various elements uh, um, you know, we needed. We needed all four of these elements for an object to kind of make the cut. So uh, it, it had to be able to provoke a discussion that we felt was relevant. Uh, it had to offer a critique. Kim, it's, thing, sorry, it's really furry. Yeah. Don't know what happened. I can't see the, the word. The, the image? Oh, now we can now. I oh, mean, I... maybe you need to. Okay. I think it's the through again the four squares. Now, now it's a bit yeah, clear, I mean, but it's maybe, still uh, a bit pixelized. Yeah, but you just need it. I mean, you, you do read it. Yeah. I think it must be the connection. Yeah, I'm going to read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Top left says relevance. Um, so um, the object takes you into a discussion space um, that addresses the issues. Um, so um, the next one is uh, critique. So the object has to present an ethical dilemma or a provocation. Um, and then plausibility in the bottom right, the object uh, has to be believable. Uh, and um, finally, feasibility. So the object has to be something that we could actually make uh, or outsource. Um, so, um, those are the four criteria that we were uh, looking for for each of the ideas uh, in the project. Um, and uh, here you can see the final objects that Thank we made you. for the vending <laughs> machine, I hope. And we'll take you through each of these uh, individually. So this object is called the best selfer, and it's kind of a life coach meets, meets astrologist. So it, it gives you uh, messages on the little screen um, in response to your personal digital analytics, allowing you to base decisions on the data sets that it's collecting. So it's collecting a lot of data about you, and then it, it's uh, giving you suggestions for your life. This is the uh, part, this is the clickbait wear, which is a line of LED clothing. This is the part for the head, and it turns into a enabling independent workers using their appearance so passive income this piece is called flux ai as in artificial intelligence and it imagines a future where we have to work collaboratively with our own personally trained artificial intelligence system and this object is actually a kit that uh, tests the bias in your AI's uh, responses. So it, it has a small camera, a turntable, and you you place a, uh, an ambiguous object on it, and the device tries to recognize what that object is. And uh, in doing that process, it, it uh, um, reveals whether it has any kind of biases uh, within the system. This is called the Newt Dial, and it's about this increased use and misuse of enhancing pharmaceuticals and, it's, and it allows users to dial up or turn a cognitive state and then take the appropriate neurological pharmaceuticals to achieve so the cognitive enhancer persona would probably use this this pro product yeah and these are called mycopops they are a range of probiotic polypops that contain types of yeah, that are actually found in soil. It refers to the emergent understanding of our gut as what's called the second brain. So uh, scientists are now understanding that, that our guts are actually having uh, a big impact on, on our cognitive abilities. And then this is called the morning ritual, which is a set for safe 
famous in psilocybin and it's a user-friendly user set that would make preparation of a microdose sort of as easy as making a coffee is today and we're going um so this piece really came also from the cognitive enhancer persona it's all about someone wanting to control and manage their own state for productivity um, Here's a view of the vending machine in the Designs for Different Futures show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and here it is at the Walker Art Center. And uh, we wanted to create a piece that didn't immediately look like a vending machine. Uh, the idea was to display one version of each object and imply through the interface that it, it could be purchased. However, when you tried to buy one, you tended to find that they were out of stock. Um, so in the day we opened in October 2019, that second version, the vending machine of the project, we were also invited by the curators of the Venice Architecture Biennale um, to respond to take part in the international exhibition. They asked us to respond to the theme, how will we live together? And they wanted us to create a new work for an area of the exhibition entitled Among Diverse Beings. So we took that opportunity to extend the project for the third time because the themes of human enhancement and the future of work we felt were very relevant to the idea of how will we all live in the future. And this was in October 2019, not knowing what would happen in March 2020. So we have now a short video, which we really hope uh, this internet is stable enough to play. Um, we made this video for the Venice Biennale team as like a, a sort of a sneak peek preview of what we were working on. And it was part way through our project. Yeah, although uh, this might also include some of the final oh, yeah, maybe. Uh, show as well. Oh. So we'll play this now, hope it works. <laughs> Catalogue for the Posthuman is a satirical installation that uses the future of work and human enhancement to draw attention to the nature of our posthuman condition. Building from the theme of the Biennale, the project asks how will we live together if we are alienated by our working conditions and forced to augment ourselves to stay competitive? The previous version of the project featured six objects presented in a mock vending machine at the Designs for Different Futures exhibition the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Drawing upon research into data-driven working patterns, the corrosive effects of the gig economy, automation and theories of the post-human, the project for Venice uses the setting of a trade fair to present a collection of body-related objects for workers of the near future. Under the guise of fictional retailer Catalogue for the Post-Human, we present a collection of objects that mock the contemporary capitalist need to be permanently cognitively sharp, quantifying yourself with data, and able to work the long and irregular hours assigned by algorithm-led corporations. Such potential futures suggest we will be expected to further merge with technology, physically, psychologically, and socially. What are the logical conclusions of the work-life changes we're already seeing? How will AI, brain-computer interfaces, and constant corporate surveillance impact our behaviour? What are the physical and psychological consequences of giving over body and mind to the unrelenting productivity of data-driven capitalism? In the Venice installation, products are offered by the catalogue under four themes. Cognitive management, expedited recovery, optimised wellness, and enhanced productivity. Products in the cognitive management section suggest workers of the future will be expected to use cognitive enhancing drugs to increase performance. Products for expedited recovery focus on how we might sleep efficiently and wake immediately ready for work. In optimised wellness, we find products that replenish lost fluids on the move or boost gut bacteria. Designs in the enhanced productivity section monetize the body through advertising, monitor stress levels, or reduce the need to take breaks. 
By encountering new products that help users cope with a society that is no longer human-centred, but is instead propelled and mediated by post-human systems, the viewer is challenged to consider how technology is being applied in this impending future. Okay. So um, we'll go through some of the objects that we made for the Venice exhibit. I really hope you've got some aspects of the process in that video. Um, so this is called the IV apparel, and it's a wearable IV jacket that enables the wearer to take on nutrients whilst continuing to work. And it draws upon research that shows that contingent workers are often not sufficient time to take proper breaks when undertaking uh, gig work. And this is an inflatable piece uh, made out of PVC, and here's a close-up of this IV bag. Uh, and we worked with a, um, an American-based inflatable uh, wearable company to help us build this item. So this is called the Stress Watch. It's about management of stress levels. And it uses a saliva test to measure your cortisol levels. And high cortisol is a sign of stress and uh, can obviously be dangerous. But if you're not stressed at all, then the assumption might be that you're not working hard enough. So this device enables you to try to monitor your stress levels um, and uh, work up to, but not over safe limits. And this is called the REM wake, and we we're exploring this tension between the need for sleep and the on demand gig economy lifestyle. And we created a range of wearable enhancements that comment on the trend in sleep technology and wellness products. And the REM wake is a wearable alarm clock that measures your rapid eye movement or REM sleep phases and wakes you up at your most alert stage of sleep. And this is done by releasing smelling salts, which are made from ammonia into your nose. So a very extreme response. And smelling salts have been used to bring someone round when they might faint. And they're also really used a lot these days by athletes to give them that jolt of alertness. These pieces are called sleep snackers, and they're also about this tension between the need for sleep and, and the, the gig economy lifestyle. So we, we created this range of enhancements that help you kind of hack your circadian rhythms and realign them with the economically driven rhythms of uh, productivity. So um, our core body temperature changes when we become um, tired or when we're ready to wake up. And in order to retrain our circadian rhythms, uh, these objects actually heat and cool particularly sensitive parts of the body where major arteries are. And um, the concept um, here was to create these pieces that would resemble sportswear, um, but they would actually be worn uh, while you're sleeping. And the assumption being that you will potentially be sleeping at your desk or in your car. And um, so it has these cushions, this headpiece uh, that would help you to rest your head. Yeah, we like this idea of like athletic sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two things that don't work together. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the arm version, which heats and cools the inside of your elbow, the Y-shaped part that part refers to the shape of the arteries that are being heated and cooled. And here is the leg version as well. It cools the area behind the knee. So these are key areas that are um, important for sleep, uh, sleep control. Um, yeah, so for this, this little video is just, <laughs> um, it's a little uh, videos that we've done recently. This is a time lapse of us installing the work uh, at the Venice Biennale. And if only it was as quick as doing this, but we wanted to give the impression of uh, all the different construction processes we went through. And to create the impression of a trade fair stand, we used an exhibition system, so off the shelf system called Abstractor, that's a simple system of metal tubes and connectors that allows you to make sort of complex space frames really easily. And it requires a mallet to assemble. So you can see here us assembling the main units and then installing the objects, working with the technicians and lighting technicians, and then eventually being interviewed in the space, relieved 
um, with all the stress and interviewed by the various different videographers that were employed by the Biennale. So uh, this is a walkthrough of the space and uh, as you enter the installation there's this explanatory text panel about the project and uh, each piece has uh, a mark that's written in both English and Italian and this is written in the, the voice of the catalogue in a way so as if the company was was writing its own text to give you the impression that you're in a commercial environment and there are also these QR codes with each piece that take you to the project's website uh, where you can find out more about each object here you see these sleep snacker pieces that we mentioned they were definitely most challenging to make um, because they were uh, this mixture of fabric and, and other um, hard and soft materials um, we often have to to learn new skills when we're making these objects uh, and that was definitely uh, quite a big challenge so um, there were four areas uh, of the exhibit and uh, each one had a monitor that you can see here containing animations uh, about each of the objects and these were meant to represent the kind of notifications you would receive on your phone if you owned the objects so um, they tell you things like uh, how to use the object and um, you know um, if you need to purchase new consumables we also had these other um, uh, graphics that were really the idea was to kind of give a kind of barrage of information uh, as if you were in this kind of trade fair uh, like environment yeah uh, this is the remwake piece that we showed you earlier it was made from a silicon 3d print and some gold-plated electrodes so some of these objects are really a mixture of um, handmade pieces and off the shelf as well as a lot of designs and manufactured and each area uh, has its own sort of notification system each product has its own sort of fictional interface and as if you were going through the process of learning about the benefits for your productivity of each product yeah and we collaborate a lot with graphic designers and web designers to help with the graphic identity um yeah we outsourced the making of some of these objects i mean just mentioned the uh, the jacket before that's that's obviously a, quite a specialist skill to be able to produce uh, inflatable pieces like that and um also the the micro pop lollipops uh, were made by um, a graduate of the school that we teach at who had uh, specialist skills in in silicon casting um, so, um, yeah, I think there's a whole, a whole range of different materials uh, and approaches to making being used. I mean, this piece we were able to make ourselves in, in the studio. Uh, it's 3D printed and, and sprayed and then uh, the fabric wristband made. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it, it really, uh, um, you know, we, it's part of our process, we really uh, want to be able to work across a, a wide range of materials because in this case we are trying to create this impression of a, uh, a company that would be sourcing products from uh, far and wide. Yeah, I think we could move on. So, uh, you know, that's obviously one main kind of case study, but we, as you are in your work, uh, thinking about uh, this idea of uh, um, empathy with uh, sort of multi-species. Uh, we wanted to finish by giving you a bit of a glimpse into another project that we're starting to work on now. And um, Geoship, uh, this is a, a, what you're looking at here, is a small home that's developed by a company in California called Geoship. And um, they're this startup uh, that is uh, making these new houses out of a, a kind of amazing new material called bioceramic, which is a bit like human bone in its in, in terms of its structure. It's, uh, and um, you know we're working independently, but uh, we're kind of using the building platform as an inspiration. So, you know, we, we are good friends with the company, but we're developing a, a fictional product, a project, rather, uh, alongside what they are doing um, in order to discuss a range of issues. So this project will try to expand 
design discourse by applying multi-species thinking to new rituals of domestic living or to prototype dwelling, in other words, within the stewardship. So, um, you know, this idea of uh, producing discourse around sort of multi-species thinking is quite rare. Um, and uh, it's very rare to have an actual new building to work with. So um, the project imagines a community of researchers that is committed to multi-species flourishing and uh, who form an organization called Multi-Species Inc. And uh, they will work with the help of uh, an advanced AI system to try to create equilibrium between all of the species uh, in their biome. Uh, and the project is quite, quite an early stage, but we want to share a couple of different visuals that we've done uh, as a means of exploring some of these ideas. So here you can see that uh, there's a geo ship building uh, with various different triangular modules uh, that are designed uh, for other species. So there's one that, that is a uh, kind of insect uh, um, hotel, as it were, and uh, places for, for birds um, and, and plants. Um, and then this image is a kind of visual systems map of this multi-species inc organization um, that we're creating. And it shows four different departments and some of the tools uh, that they might use in their work. Yeah, we haven't really shown anyone this before this yet because it's really an early half sketch. It's almost like a sketch really, but yeah. um, I guess in the system with regards to the subject of empathy, this project really aims at ideas about empathy with other species and how far is the human willing to be not in comfort in their, with their domestic space. Um, and we use, but we illustrated this particular systems map with tools and behaviors of a group of people that we think will evolve who are radically empathetic towards other species. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to just quickly share this slide that I, I made recently in terms of social design because I thought it might help you uh, position what we do. Uh, so um, obviously a, quite a lot of design is positioned in a problem solving space. And uh, I think when when we describe social design, we say, well, actually, there, there's a problem solving space, and there's also a problem highlighting space. And in our work, we're often using storytelling and narrative uh, to highlight particular mm -hmm. issues building, and world building, which is yeah. all integrated. Really. Yeah. So um, this really falls into the category of problem highlighting, but it's still, we feel strongly that it's very much part of the toolkit of uh, social design, because we feel that design has to really augment its conventional uh, problem solving based role um, with this impactful story, if we're going to create immersive and meaningful experiences through which audiences can really uh, be involved in, in creating change. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, if you want to uh, find out any more about our work, uh, we have a website, uh, parsonscharlesworth.com, and we have an in Instagram at parsonscharlesworth. So I'll leave it there, and really happy to answer any of your questions. <laughs> I'll just stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what? I hope the internet was okay. Did it uh, come through okay? All in all, but I think it was okay at the end. Um, so right. what I thought is I want to share back to you guys what we have been up to. To. So then you have some idea what we've been that what our student or intern working on. So hang on a minute. Um, just just wonder any anyone have any like dying questions or um something you want to ask Tim and Jess? Um, is your time? Um, usually not, but I yes. think we should just start with um. You got to be teaching, you know, how how young people work now. 
<laughs> okay, so I thought I just share with you guys what they've been doing and what what stage are they at. Um, so they are all register for um, this one month summer school for this project um, we call the objects talk so but then the underneath is more about this empathic ecologist education so it's really about how we can understand our species and um, so we have just starting last Monday so this is the second week but they have been um, I think it's really good that you conclude with the problem solving because they actually was dying to ask, can we solve the problem now? There's so much thing we want to change, but we've been holding, holding on, like say, no, 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 just go out and observe. Yeah. So <laughs> what they've been doing, um, you see this student, um, she was like immersing herself into some objects, non-human objects that she find in the local community. And all the things on the floor is some of the hand drawings by primary school kids that they how they see their non objects and uh, non human objects that mm -hmm. they've been looking at. Um, so they've been like going out with five senses. So everyone need to find hundreds of objects in a, a, a pathway that they've been walking around and. Yeah, really amazing. See how they also looking at five senses like touching, seeing, smelling. So it's and there's no right or wrong. It's an exercise that we want them to start to immerse. And so this is some of the really good examples that they how they see the things. And so what they've been doing is this local area um, called some tribal. And then um, they have been doing so this is the goal that we are collectively making this. <laughs> so this so is cute. called the objects map. Um, <laughs> this is just an example. This is not the real one yet, but this is how we imagine all the students, they're helping us to map out this Sumshoi Pro alternative map, um, mm -hmm. which will we hope become a template for um, multi-species discussion in Hong Kong. So then they don't just see human being or uh, activities about poverty or any other things, but actually mm -hmm. all the things in the the objects in the local community. And um, so this is what they've been doing. I think it's interesting what you just show um, about this object to um, mm -hmm. increase human capacity. So they are doing also the body <laughs> storming thing, but they are uh, still in the immersive uh, exercise. So everyone choose this object they want to immerse and they design this uh, we, we call the Bauhaus costume party <laughs> concept that, that they all okay. came with all this. <laughs> so they really, uh, but as I say, they will keep asking like when they can design. So, and then we just know you are designing by design this costume. So I think this is a good, I think I'm trying to bring what you guys telling um, related to what they've been doing, because as I say, I think the last slide was amazing, which is, I think I love the story highlighting at uh, the the body at uh, the problem highlighting is really important because I think a lot of them have very simple concept of design is about problem solving, and I think to unfold that because they they are first year student in design school, I think that will be the first message. But then to unfold them or just like oh God, come on, this is not a typical design course, but it's actually about design research also about observation, about this uh, empathic skill. So for them, this is something very new and they mm -hmm. are very confusing. But at the same time, I think that, that those who really, really enjoy it is they just follow the flow and just go out and do it. Um, yeah, mm. so yeah, we've lovely. been sharing them all this possibility of like the new eco materials, like all this co-living with humans. Mm -hmm. This immersing exercise will be referenced a lot from artists to designers. Um, a lot of performance uh, artwork is really amazing on this understanding other species and then how to transform our body. So I thought this can be maybe the starting point of our conversation, how you guys see um, this type of approach become something important for new design to happen how how you see that 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've uh, come at this from different backgrounds. I think for speaking for myself, coming out of uh, product design, the industrial design background, you know, I always felt that uh, um, it was, there were a lot of limitations on expressing yourself around these big important issues in the world so even something you know like um, uh, climate change and sustainability you know if you're uh, an industrial designer and your job is to design and really make so many environmental decisions uh, because even if you try to change the material then uh, it's like the, the, there are so many commercial constraints around that. So uh, even just getting like a friend of ours we were speaking to the other day uh, on this subject, he was making a, a plastic product in an industrial designer, and they just wanted to add a little bit of extra recycled material into the mix for for a component, and and the uh, uh, the client said no. Uh, we're we're not going to do that because we're worried about the the finish on the the surface. So, you know, I think for for me, I when once I discovered this uh, way of working around speculation and using exhibition as a means of discussing particular issues, uh, it really opened up a whole new world. Uh, and I think it's a very it's not a, something to replace problem solving. Problem solving is needed and direct action is needed. Um, but the idea that you can engage an audience member really directly uh, with a particular set of issues and also uh, provoke their imagination by creating these future objects, uh, I found that, that quite a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think highlighting problems should be highlighting the problems of design industry and design industry comes from a set of needs and, and approaches in a capitalist system where you're, you're, you don't think that the human needs to change, you just think everything around you needs to change. Um, but maybe using exhibitions or sort of critical objects or art artworks, you're all asking the questions about how far are we willing to change what we, we start think to uh, implement or not, not, almost as activism design activism yeah. I guess but um, we're trying to try and highlight some of these issues that you might not see directly through the design sort of problem solving issues you, you highlighting a problem is almost asking before you even know what the solution is that you're trying to solve the problem that you're trying to solve so yeah and it's also about behavior change so as a, a designer in problem solving mode of course you can design a product and put it out there in the world and you hope somebody will adopt it and it, and change their behavior uh, but that's quite a difficult thing to achieve and uh you know our this other approach if someone could go to an exhibition and be so uh, kind of overwhelmed or taken by a global about life, and and so it can, it can. I think it's easy to uh, think to think. Oh, this this highlighting mode or this storytelling mode is not real design, or it's not uh, um, actionable. It's not creating direct change. But actually, I think it it, it really can create direct change. Um, Great. Um, actually, this is very relevant because um, uh, a student was asking in the chat, but in Chinese, so I just need to translate. Um, I think for them, as um, what you just say is something also very new in Hong Kong because um, they are register in the design school and they all want to become particular uh, discipline designers. So for example, if you study product design, they want to become a product designer. So they were asking, um, in what would be the, the most like um, forgettable experience or what, what drive you to continues? Because I think they were just starting. Um, 
but they were a bit confused. And also, um, I think what you guys have been doing or what we've been doing um, is something, a new pathway. So it's not like traditionally you just go and study design school and you become a product designer, fashion designer, but actually the design research opened up a lot of possibility and also it's not just about designing a product to solve the problem and then you are working with marketing team, but actually we can have our own agenda, like Jess was saying, like design activists, we are making our own um, speculation, our own questions. So maybe just tell them a bit of your, your yes. experience, like Isn't how, like, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, talk about the sort of path um, and also what keeps you going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think exactly. One thing, actually, yeah, I think one thing that's really always fundamental that you may see that in our work is we like making things. So <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The, the sort of background for me is that I've always been a maker of some sort of uh, craft and hands-on and that was has been my sort of way of expressing what is going on inside my mind the main is sort of the outcome the output um and so but studying yeah. design at undergrad you, know, you learn about processes of thinking you learn about how to extrapolate uh, in three-dimensional forms and you go through a a lot of kind of a learning curve of of how do you turn something that's in your head into something physical yeah yeah and those things are, those processes are really important mm. and that's the foundation but then i think i started to question why am i coming up with these ideas in the first place where do those ideas come from is it inspired by a brief that we're given by someone else um is and where does that brief come from where does that question come from so you start questioning the sort of hidden part of where why why am I coming up with these ideas and I think that's what I started to start that's what inspired me to start looking to this other side it's like why are we asking this in the first place what is this for what's the bigger picture and then you know what, what as a designer how are you starting to there is a time process to go through and mm. I think that's when I start to question like this idea of interaction and how we how do we mm. interact with things and why so yeah it got very philosophical <laughs> and then I was like where can I learn more about thinking where can I get hands on experience and meet more people who are questioning the origins of the idea that the brief you know where where is this bigger set of questions coming from in the design process so that's when I got into grad school and I was starting to learn about sort of technologies and developments of technologies and, and scientific theory and what happens when that leaves the laboratory and enters the commercial realm who's there at the time to sort of start applying these different mm -hmm. developments um yeah it sort of evolved from there yeah it's essentially yeah. about having a, a critical viewpoint i think uh, you know designers opportunity to question the design brief that they've been given um, but this is almost taking it a step further and saying as just said like questioning the fundamental values behind the design brief and sometimes you know if you really you know are in a position where you disagree with the fundamental values of of the project you've been given then you really probably have to get out of there and, and find a way of uh, addressing those issues uh, um, outside of that commercial uh, realm um, and uh, the, the luckily you know the uh, cultural realm is, is a great space to do that so you know this the creation of exhibitions the creation of publications that uh, address particular issues and there is a design world out there um, critical design speculative design uh, design fiction um, that uh, in raises Mm. Um, it, it's, it's a bit breaking up, but I think 
what I would is I will explain to my student afterwards, but I think we should continue this conversation. Yeah. Um, actually, um, so <clears throat> what, what I'm seeing here is like traditionally design is about problem solving. Mm -hmm. And then we are part of this movement is open up for actually design highlighting or even questioning um, using design as a tools for questioning and critical thinking, like you say. But actually, um, recently, We've been um, sharing our work with some Korean uh, friends, and they actually. So I think they just they see our see our work as doing exhibition, making publication, doing this a uh, big education summer school program. They saw we are doing speculative design or critical design, and. Then, but then we were just saying that was not exactly what we do because we don't want to just end up in exhibition. Uh, exhibition is part of the tools, but at the end we want to have um, a real societal change. So we've been looking at the term that um, with this thing when our funder called our work as a disruptive innovation, which is a, a business school terminology covering mm. first, going out to the world and make some things about what can be done in the future. So how, how you guys see this maybe something, because I, I think um, it's so exciting. Oh. Um, oh no! Sorry, Yankee, we completely lost you. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, sorry. Ah, uh, Can you yeah, go on? Yeah. You, yeah. So I was just. Yeah, it is really exciting for our student to see what what you've been doing. Um. So my question is. Would it be possible to go out to the real world, you think? Your, for example, all the, I think, Bakuria objects or something quite few. How you guys see your work? Is there something sci-fi or, or, or one day you still want to go out and make it as a real design activist? I think it depends on, uh, on the nature of each project as to what the right... Uh, output is and and so uh for example you know the catalog for the post-human project by uh, taking on this uh like you say slightly kind of sci-fi future and but trying to show we're trying to show even even though perhaps some of the products may seem appealing they also have a dark side so uh, they're all about uh, us being pushed uh, to the limit as humans and so so we don't want to actually make those products and and, and sell them because uh, uh, then we would be encouraging the very thing that we are criticizing mm. so uh, in that sense the the ideal output for them is for them to stay as uh, exhibits uh, but for uh, the output to be the thoughts in people's head as they leave the exhibition. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, we actually, we really don't like this uh, kind of idea that there is a kind of real world and we're somehow operating in the fictional world because those thoughts that people take away from an exhibition are real. And those are just as real and just as important as someone picking up a product and using it so I, I think it's it's really just about a choice between um you know how you use your design skills and, and how you choose to apply them those are all real and uh making an exhibition can be just as disruptive and someone seeing a, a piece of culture can be just as disruptive if not more than someone goes for and buying a product yeah, and I don't think we're sort of working in this, or we're not operating in the design for commercial consumption and we're in design for uh, provocation, really, I think. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just come from a design background in that we know that we know the behind the scenes thought processes, we know uh, implementations that are required to make something on mass. And I think we've probably, in, we take from some of those 
pieces of knowledge that we've learned from studying and we almost become designers <laughs> or come for a fictional platform uh, as if we were telling a story or a speculative fiction um, we end up sort of ending up creating outcomes uh, of things that we think you might actually read about in, in literature or you might read or see in a movie it's, they're all nations and you'll see they're all probably imagine an alternative to the life that you lead now um, mm. and sometimes they're pushed fantasy and sometimes they're pushed push to like magic rhythm or or they're about an alternate present or a retro future um so I do see that storytelling and narrative is the element that we use all the time. Um, and so we're not, I just think it's another uh, facet to the design process. For it. So a student doesn't have to follow it in that way. Uh, I think it's just the language. I do think language is the problem when it comes to like putting design practitioners into a box. You know, it's language that help, that pushes you into these kind of rationalization system who what kind of designer are you or you know you're not asking that of an artist or an author maybe but i think it's the language that's giving us this block of how we should define us yeah that's right um, and i think also the this the language of uh um uh business uh, is, is not always uh a, a very socially minded language you know i mean this term disruptive innovation is interesting but uh, you know it, it, it begs the, the important question of what are you actually disrupting and what are you changing because to disrupt just means to kind of throw things up in the air you know i, I disrupt something um but then what happens when the pieces land and it, is society actually any better uh, after the, this disruptive innovation? Uh, I mean, in Chicago, there's an example where um, you know the the people who who drive taxis uh, before ride sharing, before Uber, uh, a taxi driver had to buy a very specific uh, plate for the, the taxi, which uh, cost amount of tens of thousands of dollars and so taxi drivers invest a huge amount of money uh, in order to be able to drive and be properly trained and properly insured you know disruptive innovation comes along and you have a, a ride sharing service like uber and all of a sudden uh, all of those taxi drivers their investment in this particular plate and this, that, that allows them to to be a, an official taxi driver their investment is gone and now anyone can can be a taxi driver now that's very convenient for all of us who can uh, call up uber on our our phones um, but the livelihoods of uh, thousands and thousands of taxi drivers in chicago uh, was destroyed uh, very very quickly so um and you and that is disruptive innovation you know that is actually you know what happens so um i think we really have to ask uh um what is being disrupted is it actually better for society and uh, of course there are some occasions when it is um but you um of specific companies making money so i, I think that uh, it's very important to have a balance where we have of course we have designers thinking about how to make really positive disruptive innovation but i think you also need designers who are saying hang on a minute you know uh let's look at the alternatives and also let, let's be critical about times when uh things are being disrupted in a, 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 an unpleasant way in a kind of anti-social way yeah and that's what i think a lot of our work is trying to do yeah. Uh, I think it's really good to talk about um, different ways of approaching these social issues, but especially for young designers like our students, where they're just starting to learn design with the skill set on etc. What advice would you give them as they are going physically to the field sites right now and trying to observe and probably look at these? Um, 
everyday phenomenon of things that happen to them that they might take it for granted because the observations about like uh, what happened with the taxi driver mm -hmm. with the plate and also with um, these issues of multi-species uh, uh, besides getting inspiration from experts such as scientists or sociologists, while they were on the street level, what mm. can we do as a designer and what kind of observation? Would you have some, maybe some suggestions for them when they were going out to some Shepo district that they could use uh, or they could um, try to adopt this new way of relooking at our neighborhood with a fresh new eye as a designer mm. to looking for mm, questions that you burning wanted to ask. Yeah, I think observation is one of those key skills as a designer. It's kind of something that you're looking beyond what you see, <laughs> if that makes any sense. You're looking at question, asking the questions about why does this thing exist? How did it get here? You know, what are the who, is there a sense of ownership of this thing? Is there a series of systems that got this here to thing in the first place? And also what's the money or the power structures behind the thing? So you could say that about when you're walking down the street and I, I'm thinking about when I was in Hong Kong last and there's so much going on in, that, in, a, in a one street place. You, know, you can walk up and down one street and there's so much happening. There's businesses being run, there's homes being lived in, but there's also so many like, in pieces of infrastructure that are being provided, whether it's like the underground or the bus or a bus stop. So many to, to everything around you that have been designed in some form or another. They have had a series of um, questions created in the person's mind to get that thing there. And those somehow all overlap on top of each other. And so maybe there's a certain object you might see and you go, how is this causing a problem? How is, how is this object blending in with the other things around it? And how is it not blending in? You know, is it, this, does this object know that it's there? <laughs> does it know what's around it? Um, is there a particular user or interaction that it needs to be alive or not? Um, and I think it's almost just a very, it can be overwhelming if you're looking at the street like that. But I think that's what's really exciting is that you're starting to question how do things get there? What are the streets? As you said, systems that led, led to that being there. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I don't know about Hong Kong, but it's, it's quite common in American cities to find public furniture that has been designed especially to stop people from sleeping on it, uh, mm. to avoid homeless people sleeping or um, to sure. avoid uh, people skateboarding in certain areas uh, and things like that. So, you know, those are uh, you know, pieces of, of design which uh, um, are kind of coercing and changing behavior in a particular way. Um, so I think, yeah, you can you can apply that same thinking, uh, you know, you, you can, when you see something like that, you, you almost, you, you become aware of the, the city planner and, and a, a group of people sitting around a table saying, oh, well, we can't have any, we can't have any skateboard on this plaza um, because that wouldn't look good. Um, and, and in a way, it's, you, you have to offset that with, well, well what is uh, being done for those people? Are, is there a place for young people to go and skateboard? Is there a place mm -hmm. for um, homeless people to actually go and sleep? Um, and so instead of, uh, you know, it's a way of sort of interrogating the, the next level behind all of these objects. Uh, but I think what you said, Jess, about are the objects aware of where they are? I think that brings up an interesting question as well around uh, digital objects and sensing and data collection. Um, so it could be an interesting thought experiment for your students to start to imagine, you know, what if some of the objects that they're seeing actually had some kind of greater uh, abilities to, you know, 
aware of its location or aware of its surroundings. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some projects in Chicago about objects uh, that can do, sort of gather data uh, from their surroundings uh, so they can know, you know um, it's, it was really about gathering uh, uh, the data of, of crowds and, uh, and also um, air quality and, and things like that. Um, but even an object such as a, 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 a higher bike uh, or a higher scooter, you know, it has a GPS, so it, it is a location aware device. Um, and uh, those kinds of things can create uh, interesting opportunities. Yeah, it's interesting. The idea of tagging things, the Internet of you know, Internet of Things is ubiquitous now in our homes, but who has the power to control the internet of things that are actually on the street? And who has data that you don't know? The levels of data information is even more difficult to find, but it's almost like, what if one of your projects was to like uncover the data of a series of objects that you've put into place? Um, you know, how do these things live in the city? And what kind of data could you pick up? Whether it's with non-human species or human species, uh, which I think would be really fascinating. But that's right. Yeah, I mean, even the sound. You know, we we saw an interesting exhibition just uh, recently, all about uh, nature, and um, there was uh, a um, a video about this this project where um, a guy had been um, recording sounds in in a forest, and uh, this um, commercial logging company wanted to come and and uh, um, cut down some, certain trees in this forest um, but try to do so in a way uh, that it didn't uh, in the sounds of the uh, the birds and the animals uh, before they cut down the, some trees and then the company came in and, and cut down you know not the whole forest obviously but certain trees and then uh, he came back and recorded again and of course there were there were fewer uh, bird sounds, but it became this kind of tangible way of seeing the difference in, in nature between you know, a flourishing forest and, and one where uh, you know, some of the trees have been removed. Um, you, know, you can't literally hear a tree, but you can hear fewer birds. So uh, you know, there, there can be opportunities like that in the city, perhaps, where uh, you can record certain pieces of data uh, about situations and, and then introduce a change and then record uh, something afterwards and, and see the difference. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, I'll just jump up. But um, the other things I would just put into the chat is just what you guys were talking about, about this disruptive innovation. Actually, um, there's also some we think about mm. um, some some people talk about honesty and also about humble. Um, so we were just talking about um from ego, which is like an ego to like this of uh, eco design, which is something um put down the human centric concept to become a multi species. Um, so I think I think what we were looking for our student to really looking at um understanding the bigger pictures. And then find out the, I think the highlight of problem is important, but also um, understanding for them is more like about understanding the problem because um, this generation is grow up with media. So for example, the fake news concept, there's just so much thing going on. You don't know which one is true or which one is like based on a particular perspective. So whose perspective is right or wrong or, so I think, as a designer, I, I totally agree that need to be a more observation go out as a designer, but asking more questions, what we will. So this is why we put down what if. So this is will be the, just give our students some hints. So next week, we're going to want them to ask a lot of questions. So what if uh, by going out to see the community asking question, what if this can be like this? What if that can be improved? What if the birds can walking on people's shoulders? Mm -hmm. So I think there will be a lot of storytelling things going on uh, next week. Um, yeah, That's great. someone I is frozen. <laughs> yeah, should we 
Uh, as we have some uh, colleagues uh, who are different designers from other disciplines, do from interior design, landscape design, and also graphic design, do you guys have any question you wanna or or have a um like something to talk with team and Jess? Um, hi, I'm Morena. I would like to have a question. Thanks for your presentation. I love for all your products. And then I just have a crazy idea. I know we are like uh, having a co living uh, with technology. I just have an extreme idea that I want to ask you guys, uh, what if someday technology can replace us? Um, I want to ask you guys, which of your body you would like to replace? You, yeah, I'm just curious, yes. Yeah. I like that question. I guess we're slowly using technology all the time to replace parts of us. We've always used technology as a tool for our, to extend our human abilities. Um, but if we were to replace, I mean, the, the, I, I think there may be a time when in our project, we're sort of questioning how far are you willing to push the body to what? be more productive. But for me, I think, I don't know, oh. I would like to fix brain component. If there's a part of the brain that stops working, it would be great to fix that. <laughs> yeah, as, yes. as we get older, parts of our brain is not working well. So, you know, how much of you, the more you replace yourself, how much do you become somebody else or something else? And I think that's a really great philosophical question. Yeah, that raises this issue of uh, are you just trying to maintain a level of ability that, that humans already have, or are you actually trying to not necessarily in a kind of superhero way, but uh, but you know, in uh, perhaps in the ability to to connect connect directly with other people or oh, other species, tele telepathy, or yeah. yeah, you could. I mean, you guys are uh, looking at empathy as a subject, so you know, what if you could actually uh, understand what it was like to to be in a, another species? So, what if you could be a, uh, inside an octopus's brain like, and and really fully understand? what it was like to be an octopus or a dolphin or one of these species that we actually kind of think might even be more advanced uh, than uh, than humans but we just, just don't know what it's actually like uh, to be them so i think those i'm interested in those kind of abilities more than say you know being able to jump over buildings or something like that I think this is a very good question and I think for us designers we always have to use design tools to tell a good story and we found that video it's one of the way that you guys might use as uh, future narratives probably need some storytelling. Do you want to ask about what's the uh, relationship between design or uh, video or maybe telling a story through moving images? Would you maybe share a little bit on that, how you use this medium? Yeah. It'll be the last question, so I think it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I think um, storytelling is so, you know, it's in our nature for communication. It's like the first thing we ever did, I think, is start communicating with language and and visual language and storytelling is probably what people did around fires in caves. No matter where they were in the world, they started to tell stories and imagine or tell, re you know, they would share knowledge or how to kill an animal or how to find water. You know, these are all early tools of the human as storytelling. You know? I think it's so in our nature to sort of be immersed and our brain is very capable of imagining something in, our, in, a, in, a, in a space in our minds without even having to see it. Um, so for us, I think we sort of, I know that for me and I, I use objects and storytelling to sort of imagine who might be interacting with this thing that doesn't exist yet, what opportunities or failures might there exist when they do, and the sort of series of frames that like a film uses or, uh, or animations, it, it, that sort of helps capture a series of moments of interaction with the thing or the people. Um, so I guess I'm rambling a bit, no. but I, I think storytelling and 
visualizing it as a storyboard is such an important skill to have as a designer, as an artist, because you can sort of create a whole world in that way. Um, yeah, you're thinking through a journey and a process and an experience for someone. And I know that, you know, we've got to this stage of being able to to make these these short films, uh, but uh, really it, it's uh, just as valuable to be able to, to try and, and tell those stories, uh, you know, in simpler ways as well, you know, when you're starting out. So, I mean, we've often just made a single object and then written a short piece of text with it. And by, just by putting those two things together, uh, you can really create uh, a, a little world for someone because they they see the object and then the text can, can position that object within somebody's life. Um, and so it can be, the tools can be very, very simple. To making uh, these more complex uh, films, um, you know, and I think that that actually, um, you know, film also has a, a problem in the sense that it, it uh, it's so immersive that it's like you know, it tells you uh, what to think in a way. It tells you this is the version of events, uh, whereas obviously, you know, you, you've all had that experience of reading a book, and then it's your your mind is is creating the visual. So it, it's quite useful to I think to to not create the entire uh, film, but to give someone the opportunity to do the imagining for themselves, by just by giving them a, the starting points. Yeah, I do think VR is something that's gonna push the level of skills that we have as storytellers. Mm. Um, even I hate VR, I sort of love it at the same time, but there will be a level where it's so skilled and so advanced that we Want to get into a space as well as experiencing it all at all that all senses, not just visually. I think haptics and smell and sound and and you know the things that we might be standing or walking in amongst are going to be part of that experience. But yeah, but yeah good question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we've really run out, yeah. unfortunately. Um, yeah. So, so I think. Yeah, yeah, thank so you so much. I think we want to just, just uh, conclude, conclude with our video, our video we, want share, we, we want to share with you guys so and also our students to conclude this discussion. this discussion, what design can do, um, not just product or functional piece, but also storytelling. So hmm. I just want to show this and, and team and Jess are welcome to go because I think this is the video that we've been working on for our dementia project, which has got crazy products and also a narrative and yeah. but a, the evidence of people with dementia yeah. telling us that this of like, when the brain, when you can replace your brain, that something is, is not functioning. So this is how we imagine dementia have this new perspective. So, but thank you so much, Tim and Jess. We will be in touch. Yeah, thank this is wonderful. So yeah, 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 good luck with it all. It looks, it's going to be really, it looks so exciting what you guys are doing. So good luck. Yeah. Thank you again.